Hello and welcome to a, another uh, tutorial for undergraduate acute medicine and this topic is fever in the returning traveller or imported fevers. My name is James Piper, I'm a senior fellow and clinical lecturer in acute medicine. Welcome to another YouTube tutorial. In this tutorial I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of a travel history and how to take one, the clinical assessment of someone who presents with fever, uh, initial investigations, some common causes of undifferentiated fever and notifiable infectious diseases. I'm primarily going to focus on um, imported uh, or travel uh, infection related diseases as opposed to um, non-infectious causes. So why is an infectious disease important? Well, uh, this is a screenshot from uh, Flight Path, and you can see about how easy it is and the extent to which um, we have moved into an international uh, world and we are a truly um, global uh, world now. And you can see these is all the different flight paths from multiple continents um, over extensive parts of the world. So you can see how just easy it is for an endemic uh, infectious disease to very easily be imported to uh, countries where the disease isn't endemic. And I think obviously we've had recent experience that with uh, coronavirus 2019. You can see how easy it is for emerging um, and pre existing pathogens to spread spread across the world. So in our role as acute physicians, we will need to have a, uh, a good handle um, on uh, high risk infectious disease and how to recognize and how to manage them. So this chart here, this is um, uh, from uh, the World Health Organization. You can see this is a fairly simplistic map or the important one of the types of emerging diseases um, that there are around the world. And you can see, for example, in our patch, uh, you can see that there are newly emerging episodes of cryptosporosis, E. coli, uh, and adenometovirus. Uh, Middle East, there's MERS coronavirus in Russia and Eastern Europe, typhoid, uh, diphtheria, um, and obviously in the United States, for example, measles um, is re-emerging. Uh, and I think this is largely due to the um, anti-vaccination movement, but you can see how these diseases are re-emerging. Uh, there's also a significant burden of antimicrobial resistant disease in the United States. Uh, into South America, you're looking at emerging a sort of acute flaccid myelitis uh, and other viruses, yellow fever, for example, in Brazil, uh, in Africa, HIV, of course, remains endemic. Uh, newly emerging are viruses such as Ebola, human monkeypox and Zika virus. Uh, if we go across to Asia, you can see you have H7 and 9 influenza, HSM1, SARS, drug resistant malaria, um, Handra virus, and so on. So you can see that there is a significant burden of uh, deliberately emerging, uh, re-emerging and newly emerging diseases. And unfortunately, we should also be aware that infectious disease could also be used as a biological weapon. That's a cheery thought for you. So what is the scale of risk? So if we have a quick look um, at the world uh, in data, with the world is still comprised of 195 countries. The world population is 7.7 .7 billion. There are 40 million air flights per year. Their deaths due to diarrhea diseases are 1.6 million per year. There are 1 million HIV deaths per year, 600,000 malaria deaths per year, 100,000 deaths due to war and conflict, 40,000 deaths due to tetanus, but zero deaths due to smallpox. So smallpox has remained eradicated. Now, if we think about some of our recent conflicts and some major catastrophes, such as the explosion um, in Beirut, the Syrian conflict, uh, climate change, um, and the sort of the um, translocation of people, um, you can see how easy it is um, for uh, catastrophic conflicts um, and those where health systems are overwhelmed, such as in the Beirut explosion, um, just how easy it is for health systems to collapse. And you can also see with climate change where um, due to poverty, people are unable to move. So diseases become uh, endemic. And you can see um, this young lady here is walking around in a paddy field. So travel to developing countries is associated with an increased risk of infection. And it's important to realise that there were 9.7 million visits abroad by UK residents to places outside the EU and the United States of America. Now, for the vast majority of travellers, up to about 70%, just develop self-limiting illness. And so that's usually uh, what's known as sort of traveller's diarrhoea or, um, you know, other sort of synonyms. 
8 to 15 percent of travelers require medical care and so fever is a very common symptom presenting to our acute medical services so what should be in a travel history so have a few minutes jot down a few thoughts about what you think should be um, in a travel history and now we're going to go into what should be in one so the whole concept of a travel history is um, similarly to a sexual history, and that's to assess uh, an individual's risk of having acquired a specific infection. And what you're wanting to do is to try and establish an epidemiological link between the presentation and uh, the traveler's history. You want to take a detailed geographical history where as possible. You want to uh, go as far detailed as to town, city, county, country, uh, and modes of travel, where you'd stayed and so on, and with whom, and under at activities I've taken. So it has to be, in order to be a complete travel history, it does need to be quite forensic in your approach. You want to take time of onset and record the duration of symptoms. Now, most tropical infections become symptomatic within about 21 days or three weeks and the majority within a month of leaving the endemic area. So it's important to record the following things. So the destination, where was the traveller going? Where have they been? And did they make any stop or layovers? It's important also to realise that family visits actually pose a higher risk of contracting a, a traveller's infectious disease rather than tourism. Now, that's partly because obviously if you're visiting family who are in an endemic area, you're going to spend much more close contact time. So for example, tuberculosis is a good example of this, uh, where um, tuberculosis spread by by coughing as an airborne pathogen um, can very easily be spread in close quarters. So the setting where you, um, where you out in the country, um, where you're staying in a hotel and so on, um, what sort of destination uh, was it? Was it a sort of holiday club? Um, uh, all those sorts of things. Was it rural versus urban and the type of accommodation? So for example, family, friend, hotel, uh, outdoors, camping and so on. And what sort of activities? So wait, did you go to a game park? Did you do swimming? Uh, were you just on a business trip? Uh, and so on and so on. And also you need to ask about sexual activities as well. So other things to think about, similarly to what I've just touched on, so uh, game parks, uh, caving, health facilities, did you visit any? Did you require any medical intervention? Did you need any surgery? Did you have blood transfusion? Did you have any intravenous injections? Exotic foods, fresh or saltwater exposures such as uh, schistosomiasis in Lake Victoria as a classic example, sexual history and any unwell contacts whilst traveling. So your clinical assessment of a patient who presents with fever in a returning traveller, you're obviously going to record a fever, rash and eschar, which I have shown uh, in this picture here, which is a ulcer with a uh, black narcotic core that's known as an eschar, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy and jaundice. These are the most common features um, often seen in those who have um, fever. So again, have a think about what initial investigations you might order. So again, pause the video, jot a few thoughts down uh, before you move on. And now we're going to talk about um, what investigations I would order in a patient who has uh, fever and a returning traveler. So these are probably the most appropriate initial investigations. So a malaria screen, a full blood count, blood cultures, uh, urea and electrolytes, liver function tests, serology and PCR tests. So, for example, um, you know, um, syphilis, for example, PCR test, HIV testing, urinalysis, chest x ray, and a liver ultrasound. So, malaria should be excluded in all patients with a history of fever returning from the tropics. It is the most important, potentially fatal cause of febrile illness in travellers returning to Europe from the tropics, especially um, sub-Saharan Africa. A minimum incubation period for malaria of six days means that the majority of short-term travellers with malaria develop their first symptoms when returning home. Most plas plasmodium falciparum cases present within a month of return, but may present over six months later. And again, this is why it is important to make uh, a malaria test a mandatory screen uh, for fever in a returning traveller. Plasmodium vivax and ovale due to presence of hypnozoites and plasmodium malaria can, due to long persistence in the blood with no symptoms, can present up to a year. 
The distribution of malaria is throughout the tropics um, and the mode of transmission is from the Anopheles mosquito biting during dusk to dawn. So it's all important that all febrile patients from malarious areas of the tropics within a year should have an urgent blood film and rapid diagnostic tests for malaria performed regardless of whether or not malaria prognosis uh, prophylaxis has been taken. It's important as well to note that a significant number of travellers to malaria endemic countries do not take malaria prophylaxis or if they do take it, they take it inadequately. When taking malaria prophylaxis may delay onset symptoms and obscure microscopic uh, diagnoses. When the lab receives the sample, they will often request three films over 72 hours uh, and also do a parasitic parasite level and you can see here this is a blood film uh, from hematology.org showing a slide containing plasmodium falciparum. So a full blood count test can be very useful and that's to perform and examine for lymphopenia. Um, so this is particularly common in viral infections such as dengue, HIV and typhoid. A raised xenophil level can be seen in parasite infections and fungal infections. Thrombocytopenia can also be seen in malaria, dengue, acute HIV, typhoid and severe sepsis. It's also worth noting that lymphopenia is one of the biochemical markers of coronavirus 19 infection. Obtain two sets of blood cultures um, and the reason that this is particularly important is if you are concerned about typhoid, um, blood cultures is actually one of the most sensitive um, pickups uh, test for typhoid and it has a sensitivity of up to 80% in typhoid disease. Let's talk a little bit about the regions now. So some of these infections uh, you'll need to go away and do a little bit of, of reading about, but I will talk about some of them. North Africa is, um, which contains countries such as Mauritania, Mali, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Niger and Chad, or above the African transition zone, will have endemic infections such as enteric fever, brucellosis, Q fever, Mediterranean spotted fever, leptospirosis, filariasis and acute schistosomiasis. Central Africa, um, which include um, countries such as Nigeria, the Central African Republic, uh, Cameroon, uh, heading towards Gabon, Congo and Uganda uh, and the Congo. Um, these have much more uh, sinister pathogens such as hemorrhagic fevers. And you can see that the differential diagnosis um, and the more severe infections um, can be seen in those who have traveled from Central Africa. And they include malaria, trypanosomiasis, enteric fever, brucellosis, meningococcus, typhus, tick bite fever, leptospirosis, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, Marburg, filariasis, acute schistosomiasis and trichinosis. So you can see that there is an extensive body of uh, diseases that can be uh, are endemic to Central African uh, region. So you'd have a high index suspicion um, and low threshold for isolating these patients and putting them in a potentially high secure infectious diseases unit. So South Africa. Um, so this uh, tends to be obviously um, primarily the country of South Africa, but also sort of Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique um, and Swaziland. Uh, these common endemic infections include malaria, enteric fever, brucellosis, typhus, tick bite fever, leptospirosis, dengue, chukagunya, filariasis and acute schistosomiasis. Now we move around to Latin America and Caribbean, including countries such as Venezuela, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina and Chile and Uruguay. They again have a fairly widespread um, endemic disease from malaria to um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Bartonella or otherwise known as cat scratch disease, hantavirus and also the presence of viral hemorrhagic fevers. So Asia um, has endemic disease, again, with malaria, enteric fever, melioidosis, leptospira, dengue, the hemorrhagic fevers, schistosomiasis, and as listed. So malaria needs excluding, as I said, in all patients who have returned from the tropics. Malaria can be fate, potentially fatal, and I have seen a patient who had what's developed blackwater fever, which is systemic acute kidney injury and liver failure secondary to malaria. Incubation can be six days, but can persist for a year, and it's caused by the Anopheles mosquito biting during the night. 
Classical clinical presentation of malaria includes fever, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, and malaise. In infection with Plasmodium falciparum, uh, this can cause confusion and seizures, otherwise known as ce ce cerebral malaria, and it does need an urgent rapid diagnosis. Enteric fever, or typhoid and paratyphoid, um, are some of the most common serious tropical diseases requiring treatment in travelers returning from Asia. It is relatively uncommon in Africa. The incubation period for typhoid and paratyphoid fever is from 7 to 18 days. The distribution of uh, typhoid is worldwide, the highest incidence being found in South Central Asia and Southeast Asia with 100 cases per 100,000 person years. Enteric fever is a common cause of fever, particularly in those visiting friends and relatives. Fever is almost invariable in the presentation of typhoid and other symptoms and signs are often non-specific, and these can include such as uh, symptoms such as headache, constipation, diarrhea and dry cough. Full blood count and liver function tests may be normal or deranged in almost any pattern of disease and complications such as gastrointestinal bleeding, intestinal perforation uh, and typhoid encephalopathy occur in about 10 to 15 percent of patients and are more likely if the duration of illness is greater than two weeks. It's important to notice that uh, vaccination provides only an incomplete protection against typhoid fever and does not protect from uh, paratyphoid. Blood cultures have the highest yield within a week of symptom onset and stool and urine cultures become positive after the first week. The sensitivity for blood cultures is 40 to 80 percent, but with modern blood culture technology, it may be even higher. Urine culture and stool culture have a lower pickup rate of up to uh, about 60 odd percent. It's important also when treating uh, typhoid and enteric fever and the patient's clinical patient, uh, sorry, clinical condition is unstable, treatment should be started empirically pending blood culture results. There is uh, increasing reports of fluoroquinolone resistance and intravenous keftriaxone is now preferred as the first line agent um, for enteric fever. Alternatively, uh, azithromycin uh, can be used as well. Rickettsia infection is common, especially in travellers visiting game parks in southern Africa. The majority of travel associated cases are caused by Rickettsia africae or America, sorry, African tick bite fever or Rickettsia coronae, which is Mediterranean spotted or tick bite fever. There are other uh, species such as Rickettsia typhi or murine typhus and Orentia tusuk gumarushi, uh, try saying that after a few vodkas, um, scrub typhus from Asia are reported. And the incubation period for uh, Rickettsia is about five to seven days. This clinical presentation of um, Rickettsial infection, more than 80% of infections, uh, sorry, patients report fever, headaches and myalgia. And there are classic signs of an inoculation, eschar, rash and lymphadenitis, although that is seen in less than 50% of patients. Complications of African tick bite fever are rare, although reactive arthritis uh, can recur. Treatment should be started on strong clinical suspicion while other diagnoses are excluded. Confirmation of the diagnosis is retrospective and based on paired initial and convalescent phase serum samples at three to six weeks. Seroconversion in Rickettsia africae can take up to six weeks. When treating uh, Rickettsial illness, a combination of an illness onset within 10 days of exposure to ticks in game parks, fever and headache with or without rash is sufficient to prompt treatment with doxycycline 100 milligrams uh, twice daily. The treatment duration is uncertain, but seven days or for 48 hours after fever uh, settles is common practice, but patients seldom need admission to hospital and should respond within 24 to 48 hours. If they don't, it might be that they need um, further antibiotics, including fluoroquinolones or azithromycin. So arboviruses um, are numerous and there are over 500 arboviruses. Examples of these include dengue and chikungunya. There are over 500 arboviruses, although illnesses in most patients are self-limiting. Some arboviruses though, such as dengue, are found throughout the tropics. Other are more restricted, restricted to specific regions. So for example, tick-borne encephalitis in Central and Eastern Europe. 
there are four main clinical presentations of arbovirus. The first one being systemic febrile illness in all arboviruses, two hemorrhagic fever such as dengue, yellow fever, rift valley fever, and common, uh, sorry, Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever. Encephalitis, such as Japanese encephalitis, West Nile tick-borne encephalitis, and Rift Valley fever. And the fourth one is polyarthritis or arthritis, which can be seen in Tukagunya, Ross River, Barma Forest, Sinbis, Eastern, and Western Equine viruses. Currently, the most common arboviral infection in returning travellers are dengue and chikungunya. Dengue is found throughout the tropics, but particularly Asia and South America, and the incubation period for dengue is four to eight days, and chikungunya is about two to three days. Chikungunya was initially described in East Africa. In recent years, there has been an epidemic originating in Mauritius and spreading to large areas of South and Southeast Asia, and in 2007, transmission was documented uh, in uh, Italy. So as you can see here, you've got the different species of the uh, mosquito biting. And so you have the day biting mosquitoes of the genus Aedes, in particular Aedes aegypti, act as a primary vector of both dengue and chikungunya. So the spectrum of illness seen in dengue fever varies from a mild febrile illness uh, to dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome, although dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome are relatively rare. Classical dengue fever is characterized by a febrile illness associated with headache, retroorbital pain, myalgia, arthralgia, in particular back pain and rash. During the first phase of the illness, the rash is erythrodermic in nature, becoming petechial later. Bleeding gums, epistaxis and gastrointestinal hemorrhage would be uh, concerning for um, hemorrhagic fever, although not themselves necessarily indicative. You can also see in rare periods hepatitis and myocarditis. Dengue hemorrhagic fever is classified by a triad of hemorrhagic manifestations, including thrombocytopenia of platelets less than 100 and objective evidence of plasma leakage. In addition, you have a dengue shock syndrome, which has a mortality rate of up to 40%. Chikungunya presents with very similar symptoms to classic dengue fever, although generalized arthralgia is a more prominent feature. The fever will start to resolve spontaneously after five to seven days, and between five and 30 may go on to exhibit chronic arthropathy. Acute dengue fever can be confirmed with a positive PCR or if symptoms have been present over five to seven days with a positive IgM antibody test. Once a diagnosis of dengue is suspected, the primary clinical aim is to identify those at high risk shock. So for example, uh, thrombocytopenia, evidence of plasma leakage um, would be admitted for management. Most patients with dengue can be managed with outpatients with daily full blood count, two chemet hematocrit and uh, a platelet count. In dengue, the use of non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories um, should be avoided. This here is a picture from the Royal Free High Security Infection Disease Unit, and these are the three, the triad of things you look for in a dengue hemorrhagic fever. So acute schistosomiasis. So the incubation for acute schistosomiasis or Katayama syndrome is about four to six weeks. It is primarily seen in Africa and very occasionally in Southeast Asia, South America and the Arabian Peninsula. Schistosomiasis is transmitted via fresh water exposure, usually by swimming in lakes or rivers, which allows cicaria, released from snails, to penetrate intact skin. Symptoms and signs of schistosomiasis are non-specific, but include fever, lethargy, myalgia, arthralgia, cough, wheeze, headache, and cicarial illness, diarrhea, and hepatosplenomegaly. Almost all patients who have uh, acute schistosomiasis will have an isanophilia. However, only a minority will have positive serology or over of uh, schistosomiasis identified on stool, semen, or terminal urine sample. The combination of freshwater exposure previously and fever, urticaria, rash, and xenophilia makes the diagnosis of acute schistosomiasis likely, and the treatment is um, Pratiquantile, which is given in 40 milligrams per kilo in a divided dose, four hours apart. 
So leptospirosis. So the incubation period for leptospirosis is seven to 12 days. Now, what's important to note is that the distribution of leptospirosis is worldwide, including the United Kingdom, although most cases diagnosed in the UK are from abroad, and that's about 50%. Predominantly, leptospirosis is acquired in tropical and subtropical countries. So as you can see, I've put up there sewage treatment works and uh, rats, and that's because leptospirous species are excreted in the urine of infected animals, in particular rats, but also dogs, cattle, and other domestic and wild animals. Humans acquire the infection either through direct contact with urine or with urine contaminated water. Therefore, risks include um, occupational, such as sewage works, recreational sports, or uh, water exposure and flooding. Clinical presentation varies from mild flu-like symptoms to a severe illness characterized by hemorrhage, jaundice, and hepatorenal failure, and this is known as Wiles disease. Leptospirosis classically follows a biphasic course with an initial bacteremic phase with flu-like symptoms lasting four days to a week, followed one to three days later by immune phase characterized by fever, myalgia, especially the calves, hepatorenal syndrome and hemorrhage. You also can get conjunctival um, suffusion or swelling. The investigations, however, for leptospirosis are fairly nonspecific. You may see um, proteinuria and hematuria. There may be an elevated white cell count, thrombocytopenia and anemia. There may be biochemical evidence of renal failure and a high bilirubin uh, with a transaminitis. Confirmation of the diagnosis is most commonly serological, with the earliest positives appearing six to ten days um, after symptoms, and you perform an IgM titer um, of leptospira, leptospira tests. Treatment should be upon suspicion given the non-specific nature of the initial investigations. Early mild disease is generally self-limiting uh, sorry, self -limiting, and penicillin and tet tetracycline antibiotics are thought to be effective during the bacteremic phase. Patients presenting with classical signs of Wilds disease such as jaundice can become very unwell despite therapy and may require uh, renal or liver support. Amoebic liver abscess, as you can see on uh, this uh, ultrasound scan, there's an amoebic abscess um, on the uh, right hand side of the picture. The incubation is 8 to 20 weeks with up to one year reported. Distribution is worldwide with the highest prevalence uh, in developing countries. Transmission is via fecal oral route and the combination of fever and a raised right hemidiaphragm on chest x-ray should raise the possibility of amoebic liver abscess. 72 to 95 percent of patients presenting with amoebic liver abscess describe abdominal pain. The pain is largely localized, will have a fever and hepatomegaly clinically. Another percentage of patients, about 20 percent, will have a history of dysentery and only about 10 percent, however, will have diarrhea at the time of diagnosis. Clinical investigations include a raised neutrophil count, raised inflammatory markers and a range of function tests. There may be the requirement to have amoebic serology performed Empirical therapy with tenadazole or metronidazole should be started in patients with a suggestive history, epidemiology and imaging. An example treatment regime includes metronidazole 500 milligrams three times a day orally for seven to 10 days will result in a cure in over 90%. Surgical or percutaneous drainage is rarely required and should only be considered if there is diagnostic uncertainty. Uh, symptoms persist after four days of treatment or if radiologically there is a risk of imminent rupture, particularly a left lobe abscess rupturing into critical sites such as the pericardium. So brucellosis has an incubation period of two to four weeks and has a worldwide distribution, but in particular the Middle East, the former USSR, Balkan Peninsula and the Mediterranean basement and South America. The commonest mode of transmission of brucellosis is ingestion of infected, unpasteurized milk products. Farmers, veterinarians and abattoir workers may become infected through direct contact between infected animal parts such as the placenta and cuts and abrasions. Laboratory workers are at risk through inhalation of infected aerosolized particles. Fever is the commonest presentation of brucellosis, but it also can uh, vary from an acute febrile illness with rigor to a low-grade fever. On physical examination, there may be lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. 
Complications include septic arthritis and other osteoarticulate disease. Initial investigations will often reveal a mild transaminitis and pancytopenia. Bone marrow cut specimen for culture has the highest sensitivity and is considered the investigation of choice. The sensitivity of blood culture to brucellosis varies from 15 to 70 percent, depending on the laboratory. Q fever caused by Coxiella burnetti is rare than brucellosis, but presents with a similar demographic situation, often with non-specific symptoms, and serology is key. Treatment of brucellosis is long and not particularly straightforward, um, although recent reviews have suggested a combination of doxycycline and rifampicin, both for six to eight weeks, and gentamicin for two weeks. It's important when um, considering um, different diseases to also think about their uh, to think about their incubation periods and just before I just want to talk about um, a couple of other uh, infections so particularly HIV the possibility of acute HIV infection should be considered in all travelers presenting with fever the prevalence of HIV in many tropicals is high up to a third of the sexually active population and not restricted to defined high-risk groups such as men who have sex with men between 5 and 51% of short-term travellers take part in casual sex while abroad, with higher rates reported in long-term travellers. Many sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, seroconversion, gonorrhea and secondary syphilis, secondary syphilis can present as a febrile illness. So when you look at the incubation period, so um, short, uh, again, thing, similarly to toxicology, when you're thinking about the dromal uh, and the window periods for different diseases, um, so short incubation periods include arbovirus, viral and bacterial meningitis, respiratory tract infection, uh, bacterial uh, chest infections and rickettsia. Medium or the most common ones include brucellosis, enteric fever, leptospirosis and Q fever, coccidiomycosis, histoplasmosis, Chagas disease, malaria, trypanosomiasis, and CMV, Epstein-Barr, HIV, and viral hemorrhagic fevers. More longer term incubation periods at greater than 21 days include brucellosis, TB, acute schistosomiasis, amoebic liver abscess, malaria, trypanosomiasis gambiense and visceral leishmania. Other infections which have a long incubation period include the HIV as we've been speaking about and viral hepatitis A to E. In fever and jaundice, so again, fever and jaundice is a common presentation in acute infectious disease in the returning traveller, but hepatic um, jaundice can be seen in Epstein-Barr, CMV, enteric fever, hepatitis A to E, Wells disease, HIV, Lyme disease, sepsis and viral hemorrhagic fevers. Post-hepatic jaundice can be seen in ascending cholangitis and the fevers, uh, sorry, the diseases causing hemolytic um, jaundice include Bartonella, hemolytic uremic syndrome, malaria, mycoplasma, pneumonia and sickle cell crisis, which has had an infective trigger. So it's also important to be aware of other more common garden varieties. So we talked about some of the more um, uh, significant um, travellers diseases, but most commonly um, patients present with fever and respiratory symptoms. And this occurs in about 7.2 to 24 percent of uh, fevers in returning travellers. And these will be common infections such as sinusitis, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, but also more severe cases, pneumonia and TB. Flu is very common, although, of course, preventable via vaccination. Legionella should always be paid attention to if your patient has been on a cruise or stayed in an air conditioned hotel. Risks of TB are particularly evident in those who have prolonged family visits and overseas health workers. Exposure to dust and or bats should also make you think about histoplasmosis and coccidiomycosis and isanophilia should make you think about worms, hydatids and fungal infections. So acute traveller's diarrhoea is very common. It affects about 222 people per thousand people. Um, and common uh, uh, examples include E. coli, Campylobacter, Salmonella and Shigella. You should also be paying attention to these, the risk of E. coli, Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonella in those who have been on cruise ships and resort holidays. Often Campylobacter, for example, causes a bloody diarrhoea and the treatment is with ciprofloxacin. So notifiable diseases. 
here I've put a list of um, all the diseases which um, must be reported to Public Health England. And as you can see, I've put the A to Z um, on here. And these include um, everything from acute encephalitis, diphtheria, hemolytic uremic syndrome, Legionnaires, malaria, uh, rubella and yellow fever, etc. So just some resources for you. So um, the, a lot of the um, information that I've given in this talk comes from um, the guidance for uh, fever in return travellers presenting in the United Kingdom. And uh, this is from the British Infection Society, and that's a reference there. There's also a very good website on the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, and also Public Health England, www.gov.uk forward slash tropic forward slash health protection forward slash infectious diseases. As always, if you have any questions, you can drop me an email, um, have a look at resources, but my email address for any feedback, comments or questions is to james.piper at ucl.ac.uk. My thanks again for your attention and I'll see you soon with another tutorial.